I'm Pat Shields, the chair of the board. I don't look like a chair, but I'm a chair. <laughs> We're going to have a short business meeting because I know that you didn't come to hear me. You came to hear our speaker, Steve Taylor. But we do need to do a business meeting. The first order of business is to re-elect the board members whose terms are expired. We have seven board members to re-elect and we can uh, vote on them as a slate. Steve Anderson, Steve Kahn, Richard Fletcher, Hayden Lake, Libby Mills, Andrew Morrison, and myself. Do I have a motion from the floor to... So moved. So moved. And a second? Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor of re-electing these board members? <laughs> Opposed? Okay. All right. The board members are re-elected for another two-year term. We do have three board members who are stepping down at this time, at the end of their terms. Uh, Dan Kubik, Emily McAdoo, and Travis Slade. Uh, they're stepping down because of time constraints, and uh, we just want to thank them for their dedication and service over the years, in some cases, a lot of years. And we hope that maybe they'll find their way back to rejoining the board when it's the right time for them. However, on the happier side, we have two new board members to, uh, that are proposed for election. One is Kat Abbott. Kat, are you here? You want to stand up so people can see you? Kat was a board member back in 2006, from 206 to 210. Uh, she has years of experience teaching uh, conservation biology and field biology at both the high school and college levels. She's a teacher. Uh, she lives in Dumbaston, New York. Uh, Dumbaston, New York. <laughs> in Vermont, right on the southernmost end of the uh, Putney Mountain Windmill Hill Ridge, Ridge Line. Uh, she was an intern. Uh, she ran an intern field research program in southern Belize, and most recently has coordinated a landowner outreach initiative across New England aimed at improving grassland bird habitat. She's led some great bird walks for us at the Wilson Wetlands. And I guess now she's committed to doing that again. <laughs> so if you haven't joined one of these bird walks, come look for the notice in the spring and go on one of her bird walks. They're absolutely wonderful. Okay, can I have a uh, thank you. A motion from the floor to elect Kat Abbott. Oh, absolutely. Claire? And a second? All right, Elizabeth? All those in favor? Of oh. Kat Abbott? Opposed? Kat Abbott, you are now back on the button. Our second uh, nomination, Noah Hoskins, what is, wasn't able to be here. But I think a lot of people know Noah. He's one of the four co-owners of the Bunker Farm. He teaches his specialty is woods, soil, building. He's a can-do, big energy guy. In addition, he teaches history at the Putney School and is himself a graduate of the Putney School. He brings a wealth of local knowledge and local experience to the board. His father was the doctor, Tom Hoskins, uh, who uh, founded the Putney Clinic. So uh, can I have a motion to elect Tom? 
So moved. And a second? Second? Please. All right. All those in favor of electing Noah Hoskins to the board. All right. Opposed? <laughs> no one has to, we always elect the animals later. We have to say those. <laughs> okay. You've all gotten, or most of you have gotten, uh, our end of the year annual letter. So I'm not going to go over the accomplishments of the past year because you already know them. If you're not a member of Putney Mountain, we have some extra annual uh, letters at the back, and you can take one. And you can also join us if you'd like. You can join up online. It's a great deal, $25 for a lifetime membership. So before we do, I wanted to save some time. I know we want to get on to this sheet presentation. Before we do the treasurer's report, I just wanted to spend a few minutes telling you about our new project, which we're calling Missing Links. Uh, Carolyn, where are you? Carolyn, stand up. This, Carolyn is not a board member. However, she, this is her brainchild, and she's been a driving force in starting this project. She'll be around the influence as we build board members by the map back there, and we can answer any questions that you have. Okay. I just want to show you a very short slideshow of the girls of Putney Mountain. Back in 1991, we first identified as a goal going south to Prospect Hill and connecting north in conjunction with the Woodmill Hill Pinnacle Association to Grafton. Now that's going to happen by the end of 2020. This is Putney Mountain in 1947. We bought the summit. It's called Flagpole. And then the town forest, Puppy Town Forest, was incorporated, and the county National Wildlife Fish and Wildlife Refuge was uh, conserved. Puppy Mountain or Puppy uh, PMA, we mostly focused on going north and filling in the ridge line in that direction. 1999, our first purchases were Brewer and then the Connecticut River Watershed Council. This is Don, 2000. 2001, we added Bush. This was a donation. And then the Richards parcel, which was donated by the Dodds. 2014, I remember this, let me think that before that was. We purchased Ham O'Connor, which filled in the gap between Dye and the Conti uh, Refuge. 2018, we purchased Parsons and Nicholson. Up until this time, we had a trail through the top of that properties just with a handshake agreement. So here are the trails that we have so far. You can see between Putney Mountain and that uh, package, the, the big green spots to the north, there's a trail. We have a trail easement on that. That's the Feigelson Trail Easement, which was donated. And then connecting to the southernmost trails, we have a trail license from the Hinton family. Here's where we're going. <laughs> this is 55 acres, two little parcels from the former King Estate, 
and from the uh, Evans uh, family that we're purchasing. Actually, some of us were hoping in 2018 that we would take a breather from acquisitions. <laughs> but that wasn't going to happen. And uh, this project actually started in 2017 when the uh, former King Estate became available for purchase. Because it was an estate sale, we had to act really, really quick. And so 13 conservators stepped forward, gave us a two-year no-interest loan. We formed an LLC, and we purchased the property to be held by the LLC until Putney Mountain could raise funds and buy it back. That's where we are now, raising funds and buying it back. I'm happy to say we just last month got an award of $116,000 from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, which has been a really, really big uh, start off. And we're in the leadership number phase where we've been approaching some people. There's maps. This is the same map here is on the big map in the back, and we have maps to uh, hand out. But I just wanted to walk you very quickly through that. The parcels in pink are what we're purchasing. North of, north of that, we have, you can't see. North of that, we have a right of way leading through um, this yellow parcels, which is a permanent trail easement, which actually was donated by Carolyn and Greg Brown through their property. That links us directly with these two parcels that we are purchasing. We took eight acres from the King Estate and then exchanged it with an abutting neighbor in exchange in trade for a permanent trail easement through their property. And then got another donated trail easement, one donated trail license, and just last month, a donated, a, a donated permanent trail easement through the last parcel connecting us to Prospect Hill. So you can't see too much from this map, but take a look at the big map and, uh, and bring home a handout and you'll see it better. Okay, I think that does it for our Missing Links project. Next we'll have a treasurer's report. This, we're calling this Missing Links Phase 1 because this is realizing our vision, first articulated in 1991, of going south to Prospect Hill. Phase 2, which is in the future, will not begin until after Phase 1 is complete, is to connect Prospect Hill with Black Mountain. And if you know that geography from Black Mountain, there are trails that connect down to the West River Trail, and so eventually, which goes all the way to Brattleboro. So with that connection, we'll be able to walk from Brattleboro to Grafton. Uh -huh. <laughs> and any questions uh, will be available for after the entire presentation. Okay, let's go. Hi everybody, I'm Elizabeth Sell and the Treasurer of Pet and Hop Association. Um, I printed out copies of both the profit and loss report and the balance sheet for you to take a look at after this meeting if you'd like if you have any questions about those two reports after this verbal report, then please feel free to come and talk to me. Um, so as you've heard from Pat, Putney Mountains had another very busy year um, with land and acquisitions and such, and we are fortunate to live here in southern Vermont and in this wonderful, generous community. 
a uh, number of the, um, those generous community members are part of this board. We have a very hardworking board, and we could not accomplish any of it without all the hard work and dedication of our board members and also the generosity of all of you. As we face the future, as we face future climate challenges, the importance of supporting organizations like Putney Mountain are made clearer. This year, there was a sizable increase in the response to our annual appeal letter. Steve Anderson, a long-standing devoted board member and wonderful wordsmith, did an incredible job with our letter, as he has for many years now. But this year, this letter of his inspired all of you to donate far more. To date, we have received nearly $9,500 in donations, surpassing last year's tally by around $4,100. One of our goals this year was to come up with a better way to raise money above and beyond what we received from our annual appeal. This year we committed our time and energy to pizza night at the Orchard Hill Breadworks in Alstead, and it could not have been more successful. The whole evening was magical, with idyllic summer weather bringing out large crowds of hungry folks, and as a result, Putney Mountain raised almost $2,000. The money from the fundraiser and from your generous donations has contributed to covering almost all of our operating budget costs this year, which typically run around $10,000. sums that are left uncovered are um, covered by reserve funds. Thanks to our hardworking acquisitions committee, the Missing Link project is well underway. In 2019, we received a $3,000 grant from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board and a grant for $5,000 from the Davis Conservation Foundation. In addition, this year we have received $6,300 in donations from individuals in support of the Missing Links Project Phase 1. This long-range goal, which was merely a dream not that long ago, is now coming closer to a reality. It's a huge accomplishment. On the, on the Profit and Loss Report, you will notice that we received an anonymous donation already of $50,000, which is reserved for the long range and second phase of the Missing Links project. So that's my report, but before I end, I wanted to read the introductory paragraph from Steve's letter, which I love, and I think captures so well the sentiment of the work we do here. It's been 62 years since a small group of civic-minded Putney folks created the Putney Mountain Association and purchased the popular 45-acre semi-wooded hilltop pasture known as Putney Mountain. We don't know what their dreams were, but they probably didn't envision the magnificent woodland preserve which now stretches along the ridge line from Dumberston to Westminster. So as you can see, Putney Mountain Association dreams big, and clearly we will keep on dreaming, thanks to the sport and our wonderful community. Thank you.
uh, I arrived in plenty of time, and I wanted to take a look at uh, Putney Mountain. And so I went moseying out, immediately got lost, and the very nice lady said, oh, no, 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 you turn around, go this way, go that way. Well, I finally got to a fork in the road, the car came along, and I said, uh, Putney Mountain Road. He said, okay, he's ready to go. But he said, don't go up there. He said, What's the matter? He said, it's all mud. It's terrible. I said, come on, I got four wheels, right? I'll be all right. And that was no problem. I went right up. I got up to the top, and there was some guy in an electric hybrid car. He made it. So I think it was all right. Anyway, um, well, as you heard, I live up in Plainfield. I always have this when I'm in New Hampshire uh, speaking. Uh, how many have ever, show of hands, how many have ever heard of Plainfield, New Hampshire? Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, I'm amazed. I've got to say 70%. That's very, very good. I was in Carroll County, over in the eastern part of New Hampshire, a little while ago, and I an audience about this size, and I said, how many have ever heard of Plainfield, New Hampshire? One hand. <laughs> and he was from Passonsfield, Maine. Uh, so anyway, if you don't know where Plainfield is, North, uh, I think his Hanover, Lebanon, Plainfield, Cornish, Claremont, and we're right across the river from Hartland. Uh, it's very interesting that Putney and Westmoreland and Hartland and Plainfield are the only two pairs of towns on the Connecticut River stem between the Massachusetts border and the Quebec border that aren't united by a bridge. <laughs> different our towns are big we have an easy uh, passage across that river. Uh, so well, some people go, well, that's a good thing. Some you know, <laughs> people play the other kind of rally and keep them out of heart and we get along better. Uh, but it's interesting that uh, Putney seems to have come at me uh, just like that in the last few weeks. I just fed, uh, finished reading a book by a very dear friend of mine named Stephen Terry. Uh, titled, Say We Won and Get Out. George Aiken. Oh, yes. It's about the, uh, Senator Aiken's involvement in American foreign policy and dealing with LBJ and with Nixon uh, during the, the period that Steve Terry, the author, was uh, administrative assistant to Senator Aiken in Washington. It's a fascinating read and I highly recommend it. And it has some wonderful illustrations, of course, of, of uh, he always wanted to be called the governor, not the senator, about his early years in Putney and, and uh, growing up on the farm and, and, and you know, his growing, his, his interest developing uh, as a young man in politics and then, uh, you know, his progression. Ending up in what I would call probably one of the most important politicians to come out of New England in the 20th century. I'd rank him in the top 20 of the 25. I mean, he'd be up there with JFK. I mean, a man of deep, deep uh, uh, integrity and deep concern about doing the right thing. And it was amazing how his political career, uh, he, uh, he, he built this trust with the people of Vermont. It was absolutely fascinating to think in his last campaign, uh, his, his campaign expended like seventeen dollars to buy some stamps. I mean, and they elected a huge majority every single time. So he was just a fabulous man. Well, I, to, to introduce myself just a bit more, I, I live in the town where I grew up, Plainfield. Uh, my father was a school teacher. He taught English at, at Windsor High School for many, many years. Uh, but on the side, he was a, he was a frustrated farmer. He loved. To have, we always had livestock around. He was a fabulous gardener and beekeeper and all kinds of things. Uh, after I finished at the University of New Hampshire and served in the Army, I, uh, I came home and I had no marketable skills, so I became a newspaper reporter. Uh, and I worked down in Portsmouth for a while and then uh, got called home to the Valley News up in Lebanon, the paper that covers that part of New Hampshire and Vermont. Uh, to run the news department, which I did for about eight years. And then I uh, freelanced for a while, uh, did a lot of things uh, as 
so many of us do in rural New England, we pound out a living from the barren soil. <laughs> uh, but along the way, I had three boys, and I wanted them to have the same experience that I had growing up with some livestock and forage and all of that, going to the fair, showing cows, doing things like that. And uh, uh, we started out with uh, two calves and ten sheep, and my late wife used to say, do the 4 H project went haywire. Uh, that's all the time that morphed into a uh, commercial dairy farm and a big maple enterprise. And uh, uh, we ran it. My boys took it over pretty much. And uh, I have to say, a year ago, well, in 2018, uh, my boys said, we're not going to borrow money to keep this thing going because the milk price had been so horrible. Uh, so they sold the cows to an Amish family in Pennsylvania and we exited the dairy industry. But uh, I'm still grieving over it. Uh, I, I miss it terribly. Uh, we still have about 50 cattle on the farm, and we still have our maple operation and all that. But it's not the same, I must tell you. Anyway, so we're here today to talk about sheep. And I do have some experience with sheep. Uh, my father had sheep, and I grew up with sheep. I used to shear sheep as a teenager, trying to make some money. and. Uh, uh, when we first started the farm in, in Plainfield, uh, we had a bunch of sheep, and uh, uh, we did quite well with it for, for a time, but uh, it kind of uh, lost altitude, uh, and we exited and got into dairy farming. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a story to me that is absolutely fascinating, and it's hardly studied at all. And people say, well, why didn't you, why didn't you get a doctorate to have it? do a thesis and publish a book. Well, I'll leave it to another generation to figure out how to do that. But what it is, is the only period in New England agricultural history where people got rich farming. Never been anything to equal this great sheep boom that I'm going to talk about. And it's just a little tiny period from about 1810 to 1840. And it was very, very much evident right here in, in Putney. And I will give you some numbers to illustrate the extent of it here and in this little area right around here that you people occupy and that I'm sort of on the, on the upper end of. Uh, but it, 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 to me, is very fascinating. And it has uh, left uh, a legacy that I want to talk about, uh, which really interests me more than the the, the, the blow by blow of how this thing came to be and, and how it went down. But anyway, so we, we need to start off by understanding that in primeval times, this, this region was 90% forested. And the uh, settlers who came up to Connecticut to, uh, to uh, farm uh, this land, uh, the, they had a huge challenge right off the bat, is how the heck to get agriculture going so they could feed themselves, and how do you do that if uh, the land is covered with the vast forest uh, and enormous trees? Well, the softwoods along the river made masts for the majesties, uh, sailing ships, and so on, uh, and, and saw timber to build But for 65% of the forest cover was hardwood, and they didn't have the technology to, to process a lot of hardwood into soft timber. So what to do? Well, they set about to clear the land in a most brutal way. They used fire. And the practice was called stubbing. And it was very simple. They'd take a hatchet and girdle the tree. Let's say we have a great big beech tree, might be five feet thick, with hatchet bark. Knock off that bark right around, right around the circumference. And in a year's time, that tree will have died. There will be no leaves on the tree the next year. And so the sun's rays can shine down through and hit the forest floor, and they can begin to scratch around in the dirt and begin to grow oats, wheat, barley. And then after five or six years, that tree, most of it, will have dried out enough so we can set fire to it and burn it down. And, uh, but you don't burn down. Uh, uh, the butt log of a standing tree uh, uh, that might be five or six feet thick. Uh, so it would take 12, 15 years for the roots to rot enough so that then you could take the oxen and lengths of chain and 
pull those things over and get them out of the way and end up with what we call today a meadow, a pasture, a field. We have no conception of what they went through to do this and what they accomplished in about a 30 year window, even <coughs> up to around 1810. It was an incredible achievement. I mean, just imagine the pollution and the mess and landscape covered for years with hideous stubs. But that's how they got agriculture going, and so they could grow grain and then grow forage for uh, ruminant animals. An incredible undertaking. It is highly understood. Uh, they had no excavators, no bulldozers, no chainsaws, nothing that we have. You, know, you just go out and you want to clear a land, a forest on, on the Putney Mountain and see what it takes. Just do it yourself. Just try. I mean, what they did is absolutely incredible. So anyway, by 1810, uh, about 85% of the land there here in the Connecticut Valley and in New Hampshire, the south of the White Mountains, was cleared of forest. I mean, just to give you the scale of that, uh, devastation, really, uh, just just destroying the, the, the primeval forest, incredible uh, uh, change. So anyway, um, uh, agriculture gets going, and uh, uh, after the Civil War, uh, the uh, Revolutionary War, uh, uh, this, this region began to produce enough surplus agricultural commodities, livestock, grain, that they were able to ship down the river. Uh, and so it began to evolve beyond just subsistence agriculture to a more commercial agriculture. But it wasn't very profitable and uh, struggling. But uh, in 1809 uh, is a, uh, a milestone year. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is president, and he appoints a man named William Jarvis to be the American consul to the Spanish court. William Jarvis was a prominent Boston businessman, and uh, we obviously politically connected, but for reasons we don't quite understand adequately, for some reason he owned a farm in Wethersfield, Bow, Vermont, and uh, uh, it, 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 it doesn't add up. I mean, it's 130 miles from Boston, but here he has his farm in a place that he took great interest in and where he would eventually retire. Um, anyway, uh, Mr. Jarvis uh, accepts his appointment and arrives in Lisbon. And one of the first things he does after he's introduced to the, to the nobleman and the royalty uh, is go out in the countryside and take a look around. And there he sees vast flocks of incredible sheep, sheep unlike anything back home in, in New England. Uh, these are sheep with deep, heavy fleeces. Wool is this thick. Uh, and uh, up to that point, the European nobility had uh, basically embargoed the exploitation of good breeding stock, such as these uh, uh, flocks of sheep represented, to the New World because they rightly feared competition. But at that point, Napoleon was poised to invade the Iberian Peninsula. And the, uh, the Spanish court, the Spanish noblemen uh, were desperate to raise some money. So Mr. Jarvis and an Englishman swung a deal to buy some of these sheep. And in all, they got their hands on about 12,000 of them. About half were shipped to the British Isles. And the other half, Jarvis arranged to have shipped to New England. And imagine shipping a bunch of sheep on a wooden boat that would take 80 or 90 days to get here. Uh, you had to bring along enough feed and water to keep them alive. And, uh, you know, a, a big uh, chunk of money so had to be put up to do it. But uh, Mr. Jarvis, obviously he wasn't constrained by any ethics rules at the time uh, that he was able to pull a little, nice little commercial deal on the side while being a representative of the United States government uh, over there. So these sheep, these sheep were landed all the way from Wiscasset, Maine, uh, down to New York. Uh, a number of them came to the port of Newburyport, Massachusetts, 
And Mr. Jarvis arranged to have 300 of them reserved for him for his farm in Weathersfield. And he arranged to have them, uh, they had to be driven overland, no trucks, no trains, no, no conveyances. Uh, those sheep, 110 miles from Newport, Massachusetts to Weathersfield, Vermont. Imagine what that took. They had to have drovers, people shepherd them along. Uh, to, to the farm and got to the river and had to cross uh, the Connecticut. Uh, actually, it's interesting, the Jarvis family, uh, uh, William Jarvis's brother occupied the land on the east side of the river, what is now called in West Vermont called Jarvis Hill. And there are still some descendants of that side of the Jarvis family that own uh, that property. But anyway, so anyway, word gets around very rapidly about the arrival of these magnificent sheep. And people say, hmm, I want to get a breeding ram that I can cross on the sheep that I've got. I can get a few ewes, perhaps. Uh, and, and off and running, we have a boom, a bubble, just like the tech bubble or the real estate bubble or the dot com or whatever. Uh, people are, are crazy. They're just hot to get some of these sheep. And it's incredible the exponential increase in the size of the aggregate flock in New England that took place. And people have said, gee, that couldn't be. We sit down and, and just do a model. Let's just say that 40% of the females born are, say, to build a flock. Well, in a 10-year span, you got a lot more sheep. You count for mortality and everything. Uh, and it explosive growth. My little town, Plainfield, 1816, the census of sheep was for about 1,100 head. By 1825, 10,000 sheep. I mean, it just went like this. Well, uh, here all of a sudden is this tremendous resource of wool coming off these farms. And that attracts capital from Boston. Up to that point, the manufacture of woolen textiles was basically a, a home occupation. You heard the term home spun. That's what it was. But all of a sudden, aha, we can make some money manufacturing textiles. We've got all this wool available. Let's get into it. If you go up to Claremont and you go in what they call the Mill District, right on the Sugar River, the oldest of six magnificent big brick buildings, Cornerstone, 1816. So this was happening. And it was happening all over New Hampshire, Southern Maine, uh, Massachusetts, to a lesser extent in Vermont. And now that's another whole lecture. The difference between New Hampshire and Vermont, I will argue, is the Amanusic Fault. It is a geologic feature that runs 110 miles north and south, basically right up and down the Connecticut River. On the east side is uh, igneous rock. On the west side is sedimentary rock. That's why you have way more agriculture in Vermont. In New Hampshire, you have mill towns. You don't have mill towns in Vermont. Mill towns in New Hampshire because there are waterfalls where it passes over cross-cutting dikes in a, uh, caused by uh, the, uh, uh, you know, millions of years ago, the, uh, the, the formation of the first cross. So anyway, well, we got all kinds of sheep. We're building mills. Uh, things, are, things are really humming. And, and, and the mill towns just pop up. Claremont, Newport, Lebanon, Enfield, Ashwella, uh, Pittsfield, uh, Hillsborough, all over the place. There's a few in Vermont, too. But uh, the, the big explosion was to happen uh, in New Hampshire, eastern Massachusetts, and in, in Southern Maine. But uh, so we've got all this growth and expansion, and it is incredible. But uh, we have some problems. Um, they, come about pretty quickly. The first great challenge, of course, is confinement. How do I keep his sheep separate from his sheep and her sheep from him? What are we going to do? Well, we've cut down all the trees. We haven't got much wood to build a fence out of. And uh, steel wire hasn't been developed yet, hasn't been invented. What have we got? Huh? come on. Lots of them up on, on the Putney Mountain there I saw today. Rocks. Yeah, we got rocks. Oh, boy. Uh, so in another 50-year period that really began at the time of the revolution, but really got rolling as the sheep boom took hold, was the construction of 
stone walls. The incredible uh, feat in itself to think that in the New England states, by the end of the stone wall craze, you might say, 250,000 miles of stone walls were constructed. Wow. The building stone walls. Incredible. Second challenge is feed. Well, we've got all these animals, and we've got a short growing season here. We only have about a five month growing season. Uh, but we got all these critters, and they've got to be fed for the other seven months. Well, what that involved was every able bodied male above the age of 10. Everybody was put to work harvesting hay. They did it with scythe and with sickles. Now, I'm not kidding you about 10 year old, 11 year old boys were trained to shock on the side and swing aside and cut the grass, cut the head. Now, uh, absolutely no PlayStations, no <laughs> Xbox, no soccer camp. You <laughs> work in the fields cutting hay, and then it had to be cured and gathered up and stored away in the barn. I mean, it focused all available. Uh, resources and then of course the women had to feed them and keep them nourished to keep them functioning getting that paid uh, an incredible uh, uh, application of hand labor then we had some problems with predators now, this had been the natural habitat of the eastern timber wolf uh, but uh, heavy pressure was put on that population by cutting down the forest because that's the natural habitat but still, there were wolves around, and uh, these are kinds of uh, uh, beasts. They're prey animals. Uh, go after prey animals. They're carnivorous, and in some instances, they just kill for the hell of it. And so, it became imperative to exterminate this wolf population that remained on the land and drop whatever they were doing. If it was a wolf sighting, or there was a sheep kill, or whatever, and hunt down and kill. Uh, that wolf. Now uh, uh, there's this uh, this legend in over in, uh, in the Lenadnock region. And people uh, when I used to give this talk over there, they told me I'll put up a hand. You know why the top of Lenadnock is bare? <coughs> why it's all ledge? I say no. Why? Uh, and they will say it's because the sheep farmers got so fed up with the wolves that were hiding in the crevices up on the top of the mountain. There was still some vegetation up there that they went up there and they set fire to the top of the mountain. They burned everything they could get their hands on. They drove those wolves out and as they fled the flames, they picked them off and, and exterminated them. Wow, you know, that's a, makes a good story. Same for a target with some of the other mountain top. Uh, anyway, they got rid of the wolves. They, they, they went all out. Then they had big problems with parasites. Anytime you take ruminant animals and you build up the population, you run into parasite problems. Same thing today. There's no difference. Uh, in those days, the big uh, problem was, I don't know, still the problem. The first problem was what they call worms. We call worms. But what they are is nematodes that live in the sheep's gut. They don't kill the sheep, but they debilitate the sheep because they suck the blood. And they have a very simple life cycle. They shed eggs. The eggs pass out in the feces. They attach to the other side of the blades of grass. Sheep come along, eat the grass, and renew the cycle. Uh, that was a real problem. And uh, very interesting, uh, they tried all kinds of, they didn't have the arsenal of pharmaceuticals we have today to fight those uh, the, the nematodes. Uh, but they tried a lot of different things, what we would call today homopathic remedies. My favorite one was this. It involved a commonly grown plant around here. A lot of it was grown here. They would take that plant and they would press it and take the juice and make a tea and force some of this tea down the sheep's gullet. Now, what do you suppose that plant was? Come on, tobacco, right? <laughs> tobacco, absolutely. And they turned to tobacco for a lot of, a lot of uh, remedies. 
because it is a very powerful company. Uh, the, the chemical in, in tobacco, go to Kentucky when they're harvesting, everybody wears big heavy gloves, handling and stuff, it, it's poison. But anyway, so they, they've been doing that uh, to try, and they tried other remedies too, to try to combat. They didn't really understand about the idea of uh, rotational pasture. Well, they didn't have enough pasture in many instances. They just had to use all the land they could get their uh, sheep on uh, Then they had problems with foot rot. It's basically an inflammation infection that gets in the cleft of the bone. It doesn't kill the sheep, but make sure her feet are sore, it hurts, she lies down a lot, doesn't eat enough, and then she becomes susceptible to pneumonia or other afflictions. Um, there again, they turned to tobacco uh, for some juice, a uh, real toxic chemical, not anything that burned and was painful or, you know, was, uh, uh, really toxic would, would be a good remedy. So they tried that. And then they had ticks, and the ticks do the same thing. They don't kill the sheep, but they debilitate sheep and they suck blood. And there's some evidence that the ticks that afflict sheep even today might have come over with some of the first sheep that brought, uh, were brought here by Jarvis and uh, his successor. Uh, in my town, they would shear sheep, uh, always in June. I can't imagine shearing sheep in June. I mean, my God, what a oh, hot, miserable. Anyway, they would shear the sheep, and then they would dam up a brook in Plainfield called Blow Me Down Brook. And don't ask me where the name Blow Me Down came from. Uh, we can talk all day. Um, anyway, and they dam it up and they dump some arsenic in the brook, in the pond, and they drive the sheep to it. Now, obviously, they didn't have any EPA in the <laughs> But that was what they did to deal with the damn ticks. Um, and then the biggest problem of all, of all was malnutrition. Now, the feed that they had available, the, the hay that they were harvesting, was not prime rib. It was not top fall. They traditionally, and it was just sort of just the rule, they started cutting the hay on the first Monday after the 4th of July. And they would cut all summer long. Now, your farms around here in, in Walpole, Westmoreland, uh, uh, Westminster, Dumberston, along the river here, you notice they are done cutting the first crop of hay before Memorial Day, if they possibly can. Because that's when the nutritional value of the grass is at its peak. The first crop, the end of May, that's where it's beautiful feet. They want to cut it. But in those days, they waited until it got taller, denser, and they would start out right after the 4th of July. Well, at that point, they've already lost 30 or 40 percent of the nutrient value in the crop. And they didn't cut it all on the first day. They cut it all summer long. And they might be cutting first crop hay on Labor Day time. Uh, and at that point, they might as well have been cutting a, a, a cordwood. I mean, it was woody, poor quality, high lignin content. But that's what they did. And so these sheep were malnourished all the time. Uh, all through winter months, and uh, they suffered as a result a lot of mortality, and uh, that, that was the way it was. Now, a very prosperous farmer, like Jarvis, he would afford a little grain, he would feed them oats as they got closer to lambing time in the spring to build up their nutritional plane, but uh, by and large, the sheep had to get by with tough, poor quality feed. And to give you a, a, an illustration, in, in the, uh, today uh, we've got some sheep. We want a 200% lamb crop. That's the optimal. That uh, is wonderful when we can do that. That means if we have 100 ewes and we expose them to ram at the end of November, in April we would get 200 lambs. Well, in those days, if they got 85%, they thought they had really done well because of uh, those hundred ewes, some might have died of malnutrition or weakness, or just or uh, affliction from worms or whatever. And uh, they tended to have mostly single lambs because at the time they were, uh, uh, they were uh, impregnated, they were already in a depressed nutritional uh, plant. So uh, we have a wonderful collection of diaries uh, in my town. I'd love to read 
all written in pencil by a man. And he, 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 he was in the sheep business after the peak years, but he, he was very, very observant. But you read his diaries in January and February of the 1850s, he would say, um, you know, if I say end of January, she had one dead sheep today. Well, father and I sheared two dead sheep today. You know, they were losing animals all through the winter by uh, malnutrition. I am absolutely certain uh, that that was what the problem was that was killing them. Anyway, it was a very simple cycle of, of, uh, of farming. They like to lamb on pasture in the spring, late April, early May. And the ewes get good fresh grass. Uh, they milk well, get the babies off to a good start. Uh, shear in June, uh, summer pasture. Uh, they used the hillsides for pasture. They had to have the bottom land, the level land for production of hay. Uh, and I was very impressed up on Putney Mountain, stone walls up there. That uh, tells me those hillside, that mountainside, that was pasture. That was pasture, that was clear trees, and somebody was keeping sheep up there. Uh, and, and so, uh, and they used way up uh, above 2,000, almost up to 2,500 feet. I found all over New Hampshire and Vermont where the stone walls exist, meaning that those things were pastured. And, uh, I'm sure somebody here probably has seen vintage pictures, even as late as the 1920s, where you'd see hillsides that were, were open. Uh, it's a legacy of the land clearing and pasture. Uh, uh, Breed late fall. Very simple housing, a barn for the hay, that was the main emphasis, and sheds uh, for shelter. Uh, nothing fancy at all. Uh, but to give you an idea of the scale, the sheep numbers in the New England state, 1835, in Vermont, 1.1 million sheep. New Hampshire had 600,000, and Maine had 522,000. Massachusetts, 373, almost all in the western part of the state. Um, so we have this uh, this tremendous activity going on, all this farming activity, all this sheep, amazing. Comes 1837 is a, a perfect storm year that will explode the bubble. It will pop it. It will go like that. It will end. This period of prosperity will just plunge. Uh, amazing. A bunch of forces come together at once. Number one was economic panic of 1837 and the resultant depression that set in, which was an extremely uh, severe depression. And some historians say it was on par with the uh, uh, depression of the 1929 1935 era. Uh, and it, it hit very hard around here. Uh, Andrew Jackson, the president, had, uh, among other things, abolished the equivalent of the Federal Reserve. And so uh, currency, uh, much of the currency was the, the responsibility of states. So you have the Vermont State Bank, New Hampshire State Bank. Uh, but uh, soon afterwards came a tidal wave of counterfeiting. Uh, these uh, 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 criminals uh, in Quebec flooded uh, our part of the, of the country with counterfeit money. So it was very common for uh, commerce to discount the face value of these uh, state bank notes. So if you went to Bellas Falls, you had $100 uh, in, in paper money, uh, uh, and you were dealing with a merchant who might give you, say, it's worth $80. $70, so that, you know, that is destabilizing the whole economy. Now, the Erie Canal had been completed, the railroads were being opened to the West, and thus was beginning the movement of wool from the Midwestern state, from Ohio, Western PA, uh, into New England at a price below what our people here had been used to get, so it was pushing down the, the price. Um, and I have to tell you, there is no agricultural commodity that we can produce here in New England that somebody somewhere else can't produce bigger, better, faster. 
And so that's what we're on. Don't say maple syrup. You brought in Quebec. They, they run circles around us on maple syrup. 75% of the global pop, uh, pop, uh, production of maple syrup is in Quebec now. It just dwarfs what we do down here. But anyway, so the wool price was being uh, pushed down. Uh, Australia and Argentina uh, were beginning to ship wool into the New England market to satisfy the needs of the New England mill. And the mill owners said, ah, hey, we're going to pay these local guys all this money. We can get it a lot cheaper and brought right to our door. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. So down goes the price. Uh, but the Industrial Revolution was kicking in in good shape, and that was having a profound effect as well. Um, people working indoors didn't need heavy woolen garments so much. The diminished the demand uh, for woolen uh, uh, garments. Uh, people were uh, uh, adopting the, the production of box stove and central heat. Don't need big heavy woolen blankets quite so much. And here we're coming to like cotton. And cotton was a cheap commodity. And uh, beginning about the 1850s, the technology of cotton uh, production, textile production, was revolutionized uh, thanks to uh, um, uh, investor mill owners uh, who sent uh, uh, spies to England to copy their up-to-date uh, modern, uh, technologically advanced uh, uh, the looms and so on came back here and built them and, and built that all up. Uh, uh, incredible. And then, uh, most important of all, was the exhaustion of the upland soils. Too many sheep. And I just heard reference here in the interview when you folks were getting going here about that, the thinness of the soil. There were too many sheep. And so, as early as 1840, we can document the abandonment of pasture land, particularly above uh, 1,500 feet, uh, all over the mean, started as early as that. The, the land, uh, the, the soil could not generate salt and, and, and enough forage to keep the sheep fed up on the, the higher uh, terrain. And you saw erosion, you saw all kinds of problems. And so it just, it, it just uh, it, it receded, it, it withdrew. And in a very short time, this, this uh, huge population of sheep was just thinned out. I mean, it was just, just taken away. And out of that million head in Vermont, about a third were voted on rail cars and shipped west. Um, the rest were eaten, the population just died down, people didn't breed another crop of land, whatever, all these business decisions were made, and it just, it just collapsed, it just went down, and, and uh, 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 it's, uh, it's just amazing. So, when we, we look at all of this, I, I want to talk about two legacies of that time that we can see tangible uh, on the ground there. Number one, of course, is the stone walls. And I tell them, anybody who will listen to me, anywhere there are stone walls, there were sheep there in this period. Stone walls. 250,000 miles of stone walls built. What, a, what an undertaking. A lot of them were built by the farmers themselves. A lot of them were also built by uh, Irish, uh, Scotsmen, uh, Italians. Uh, laborers that came, or itinerant very often, moving town to town, get a job, help, help stone wall here, there, everywhere. And it's made, it was sad, it was a sort of a, a rule of thumb that two men, a yoke of oxen, a length of chain, a couple of iron bars, and a stone boat could build one rod's worth of stone wall in a day's work. I can't believe it. I mean, we could give it a try. That's less than the length of that table over there. Uh, and they, but they built stone walls. I mean, it was incredible. And you look at some of them, they have very huge pieces of stone. How the heck did they get them there? Well, they did it with cry bars and oxen and rollers and all kinds of things. Uh, and amazing, amazing thing. Well, we're down now, the estimate is down to less than 100,000 miles of stone wall still in, in existence. <coughs> And uh, where they go, well, an awful lot of them were used in the 1920s, 30s, 
uh, for road construction. Uh, we want to get people out of the mud. We're going to fix the road. Uh, the state was doing state roads, town roads, uh, handy material to use for ballast to build a base for, for a new road. Just take the stone walls along the roadside. The perfection of the bulldozer and the power equipment, we could do that. So a lot of them disappeared that way. And it, it's amazing to realize that in the 1950s and early 1960s, the U.S. Department of Agriculture would give farmers money to hire somebody with a bulldozer to come and make a great big hole and crowd all the stone wall material they could efficiently move, put it in the hole and cover it over the dirt. That practice was called obstruction removal. <laughs> to make fields bigger that are suited for, for modern farming methods. Uh, so a lot of uh, walls went away that way. And then quite a few, of course, and uh, now, uh, nowadays, a lot of them are being stolen or being taken up for what I call landscape architectural use. You know, and, and they're very valuable. Uh, a lot of money paid for stone wall uh, rocks uh, to the you old know, terraces and walls and so on around the uh, high end uh, housing. Uh, uh, my late wife and I, uh, uh, back about 2008, <laughs> we went to Nantucket to take a look around in April. And we were on the ferry going out of the Hyannis, and there were two big dump trucks on the, on the ferry with us, and they were loaded with stone wall material that had come from southern Maine. And I thought years later, I said, I bet some of those stones went to Mr. Madoff's. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there were no stones on the Nantucket, so it be like a man. So anyway, think about those stone walls, and it, it, it just amazing. Uh, all that we and then the other uh, important uh, le legacy that we see is architecture. We need to drive all around and, and see it. You know, it's all around us. Uh, you know, people write down, oh, look at that pretty colonial house. Guarantee you that house did not look like that in colonial times. 18, uh, 17, excuse me, 1766, the people were living in hovels. They slept with the cows to keep warm. That house, if it is uh, a very pretty, nice looking house, like we think of a colonial house, uh, and I'll bet you it was built in the 1820s. Well, maybe there was a house there in 1790, but it was embellished and improved. <coughs> and and, and it, it is what it, what it is today, is the legacy of income and money that was available to build a nice property like that. Same with public buildings churches and town halls all over this region. You, you do uh, a little research and you know, look at a town history to tell a story. I don't know, for the vast, vast majority of those went up in the 1820s, 1830s. And, and it's interesting, I mean, quite a number of them were built as just big boxes uh, at first. And then when there was money, they put a steeple on the top. Uh, that magnificent church of Wethersfield Center or the one in Atworth. Uh, you go look at those. Uh, uh, what they call the Templeton School of Church Architecture. Uh, <clears throat> imagine a seven-stage steeple. I mean, huge undertaking. That took money. And then when the rules were done in 1820, 1830, in Heartland, Cornish, and Plainfield are seven brick churches. So they were federal-style churches. They were all built out of native brick all built 1832 to 1837. They're all sisters. That was when there was money. You know, look at the buildings we built today. It's, uh, 30 years, they're ready to tear them down. You know, but those, those endure uh, because they're well built. Okay, I'm almost out of gas, but I want to uh, try to wrap it up. I gotta just give you some numbers from right around home here. Uh, uh, <laughs> listen to this. Oh my gosh, now, let's see, okay, I, I have a census tract for all the sheep in 1835, which would have been the, the climax year, the summit year for sheep numbers. Okay, uh, uh, 3,357, okay, uh, Rockingham, 12,601, Westminster, 13,766, um, Wethersfield, 14,407. Springfield, 17,832. 
Uh, Walpole, 14,875. Wow. You know, we'll just take, well, let's just take, uh, we'll take Putney and uh, 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 Rockingham and Westminster, and it's about 32,000. That's more sheep than are in all of New England today. Oh my just in these three counties. Wow. Think of it. I mean, that's a huge number. Yeah. I always get a kick out of it. Hanover. Hanover, New Hampshire. They had 12,000 sheep. If I showed up with a truck and a trailer with 100 sheep in the back, I'd be met with like 10 police cruisers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to wrap it up with another legacy of this time, and it's, it's a social cultural one, and that is this. There was no agricultural prosperity to come along, or an agricultural enterprise to come along and take the place of the income generation that this sheep boom afforded. There was nothing, dairy farming, any chickens, apples, whatever, nothing could compare. And that occasion, a mass exodus off the land of rural New Hampshire and Vermont. Staggering decline in population. Towns that had a mill, they had a railroad, they kind of weathered it. They kind of just went into a static, flat level. But towns that were back on the hillsides, they hemorrhaged population. Right after the Civil War, it just plunged all the way to uh, and we barely, and we haven't recovered in many of these towns. Um, I don't have good census and data for Vermont, but I have wonderful data from right across the river for those towns in Cheshire County and Sullivan County, like Ackworth. 1860 population, 1800, but 1920, 200. I mean, think of that. My town, Plainfield, lost between 1860 and 1890. 30% of its population, 40% of its tax base. Just like that, went away. And that was happening all, and it happened here, happened in Vermont. And if you were in politics at that time, uh, you had to say, what were you going to do to repopulate the countryside? What can, what can I do? What will I do? I have place to do I have place to do that. You know, just like today, say they're going to root out waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, we go to those days and talk about how do we get people to come back. One, it's, it's, to me, it's all about Queen. Is uh, the governor of New Hampshire in 1898, Frank Rollins, said, ah, I've got a great idea. In late July and early August, we have lovely weather. Let's have a festival in each town, and we'll have food, and we'll have music, and we'll have people do orations and recite poetry. And we'll get the people who went away to come back. Uh -huh. come back. And they'll see how great it is. And then they'll help us repopulate, take over some of these abandoned farms, come on back. That's where old home days started. Uh -huh. And that idea spread to Vermont, to Massachusetts, and Maine. And a lot of towns in those states, we still have old home days, old home weeks. It did not bring people back to stay. But we still carry on that tradition here way more than 100 years. We're still doing it. Uh, Professor at Dartmouth College in 1825 did this little book. Title of it, A Town That Has Gone Downhill. It's, it's, it's fascinating. He, he documents the line of mansion with maps from 1840, 50, 60, five decade, down through how it just contracted. The farms were abandoned. And it ended up with just two little villages with a few farms on them right on the riverfront. Uh, and it, it's, it, it's really wonderful uh, to read. Uh, it, I mean, you know, here it was, you know, almost a century ago. Uh, but they were really concerned about the distinguished geographer taking a look at that and, and documenting it. Uh, one other interesting aspect <laughs> that I could pick out. Um, was, uh, 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 well, I guess, uh, well, it was departments of agriculture and chambers of commerce, of whatever they were in those days, uh, would publish lists of these derelict farm properties that could be bought for cheap money. And the New Hampshire one was fascinating. 1892, 
uh, you know, 100 acres uh, house and sheds for $400. Mm -hmm. Or uh, 200 acres with barns and two houses for $515. You know, holy smoke. Well, people, those lists were circulated in Boston and New York. And that was the beginning of summer people, what we call summer people now. And then I go particularly over in the region around Lake and the Saki. I was talking to over there, and I was like, hey, you know, my great great grandfather bought our place for $600 in 1897 from a farmer. And uh, we wouldn't take 500000 for it today. No, I mean, it, uh, it, 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 that, mm -hmm. it really bad. So, anyway, uh, I'll wrap it up with the, the sad truth. Um, well, wool was worth a lot of money. And in today's dollars at the peak, uh, you could probably get the cow I'm telling you about. Uh, uh, the equivalent of today's dollars, as much as $70 a pound for wool, good high quality uh, wool. Um, what's it worth today? Almost zero. Almost zero. Why? Why? Why is that? Uh-oh. I'm looking around. I can tell the culprits. I see a lot of fleece here. <laughs> uh, well, as late as 25, 30 years ago, you know, Eddie Bauer, L.L. Bean, Land's End, look in there. They'd have a lot of wool and stuff in there. There's almost none now. All fleece, all these uh, tech, you know, synthetic fabrics that they figured out from the function of keeping warm. Uh, but uh, the, the market in the world is just, uh, just shrunk way down to almost nothing. And we have itinerant, we, we have, and you have them around here, what I call bow peep flocks. You know, people who are in shape like a 4A project or whatever. And itinerant, itinerant shields come around and shit. Uh, there was one came through my neighborhood last spring, and she just said, 50 bucks flat. That's what I get. Whether it's one sheep or three or four, I'm getting 50 bucks a minute. And she shared the sheep, and then here's a beautiful fleece that's sitting there. Uh, what are we going to do with She said, I don't know. You take them, put them in the dumpster. Uh, in the market. You know, so it, it, it's very, very sad. If you were going to go into the last real woolen mill in this whole region, went out of business about 11 years ago, it was in Newport, New Hampshire. Gilbert Woolen had been taken over by Pendleton out of Oregon. And they still had a store, but the mill is just a big concrete slab now. There's nothing left. Uh, but uh, if you want to go into manufacturing in woolen textiles, you call up the uh, Australian embassy and, <laughs> and ask for the, uh, in Washington, ask for the uh, agricultural lab texture. And they can deliver you sea boxes full of wool. Exactly every single filament is identical to your specifications. I mean, that's where it is. So, anyway. Uh, and uh, so what about the meat? Well, uh, we have, uh, the people ate lamb and mutton, uh, but it's a very, very limited uh, uh, dietary uh, custom today. 80% of the lamb uh, uh, that's consumed in the United States is consumed between Portland, Maine, and Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, it's an eastern seaboard thing. Uh, if we go to the supermarket in Arkansas or Nebraska, and you ask them, like lamb chops and look at you cross eyed. That's I mean, well, just don't, they don't have a lack of farming. A little piece of kind of resurgence is some of these ethnic populations, particularly Muslim people. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know some farms that cater to that. And it's very interesting. Those people, that, some of them are Bosnians or North Africans or whatever, they come to the farm and they want to buy a lamb, live lamb, and sell it themselves. And that's what it is. Very interesting. They will not negotiate with a woman as to be a man. And they will not pay the asking price. So if you're dealing with them, you stop way high and get the price. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, okay, I've talked long enough. I think I'm over time. And it's real dark out there. People are going to go home watch football. Uh, anyway, anybody have a quick question or two? Yeah. Farmers, 
Yeah, yeah, this guy does the lecture about construction stone walls. Now, the thing he does is the table in front of where he's talking, he brings two five-gallon buckets of pebbles, and he builds a stone wall while he's lecturing. And he can walk through the woods and he can say, that stone wall is built by Italians. That stone wall, that's a farmer stone wall. He, he knows the difference. He can tell about the way that they're laid up. It's absolutely there's a lot more to it than we realize. We just will ride by the stone wall. But an awful lot went into them. Very, very interesting. Okay, last question. I know that there's a sheep deer in the audience. The present day sheep deer. And I wondered if we could hear from him how it's, I mean, we're talking about a very different era of sheep deer yes, in this right. area. And I well, they, 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 there are some very successful, few and far between, really, compared to that time around, and I'm sure right in this area, there are some very successful people. They have carved out a market for their wool. Uh, they probably have it manufactured into yarn or blankets. Uh, they sell people who want to freeze their lamb, uh, all of these things. And uh, I, I, I'm more power to them. I think that's wonderful. I hope they stay at it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but Steve, I, I'm David Major, and I'm the player was referring to. I remember being uh, when you were commissioner of agriculture in, in New Hampshire, and you were sort of helping organize some of the Vermont New Hampshire sheep co-op, and there were some little meetings that, that uh, I attended. But anyway, I just what I'm doing, what we're doing on our farm right now, we have between three and four hundred um, adult sheep, and, and about four hundred lambs is intersects with what you're saying because uh, a lot of our, all, we can't sell all our wool. Some of it is zero in value, but others go, other goes for uh, to the $4 a pound to little outfits like one in Maine called Swan Island Blanket Company, processed by Green Mountain Spinnery in Putney. And, um, uh, and then uh, the, the lamb, a lot of this this past year was going to the new owners of Westminster Meats, which are three Algerian brothers who are processing six to seven hundred lambs and kids a week to uh, for that ethnic halal market you were talking about, and great market. They're, they're, they 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 need way more lambs and kids than Vermont and Hampshire could ever hope to produce, and they get them from San Angelo, Texas. Ohio, all, all of them. And then the final thing, and this is what keeps the farm going these days, and it wasn't done at all back in the early 1800s, is we milk our sheep. And we make uh, artisanal cheese. And uh, I've been doing that for over 30 years. And that's what, that's really where the money is for us. Yeah, yeah I, I, would, I would have to say, what you're doing and, and what you suggest right here, is what's got to happen in all animal agriculture. In other words, uh, uh, we're losing dairy. Vermont is down under 500 conventional dairy farms and about 200 organic farms who are struggling even worse than the conventional guys. And I mean, if we just go out linearly in 10 years, I'll bet there's less than 100 dairy farms left in, in, in Vermont. I mean, we're up against here. Uh, New Mexico and, and uh, Idaho, where they're milking 10,000 cows on a single farm. Uh, and, and uh, you know, consumers are wanting to drink, uh, what is it, uh, almonds, milk, and, and all these other things. So there are all these forces, but there's places in this economy for people who are specialized and who do a really great job. As far as dairy is concerned, my neighbors in Plainfield, McNamara's, they bottle their milk in glass bottles, and people go crazy for it. They, and they pay a premium for it, and, and they pedal it up and down the valley here. But if we took that model and we went to Manchester, New Hampshire, we go broke. I mean, there's, there's just not the kind of culture in, in, in that kind of urban area. There's a guy down in, in uh, Hadley, Mass, that serves Northampton and Amherst. <laughs> He's got high income, high level of education, and people love the idea of milk being brought to their door in a glass bottle. They'll pay a premium for it. And, and it, it, it gets down to uh, intense specialization 
and very close connection to the immediate market. Don't think you're going to take uh, the, the, the sheep, uh, uh, those guys in Westminster, you say 600 a week, that's, that's, that's interesting. But let, let's, let's hope they pay enough so guys like you can, can keep going. Uh, and that, that's the other part of it. It's really tough. I, I'm over time. Thank you.
Prospect Hill. So for the next couple, uh, over the next summer and the summer after that, this trail will actually uh, need to be built by trail crews. Uh, we're in the process of fundraising here. Mm -hmm. and if we have, um, this project is uh, about a $200,000 project. It will uh, be Vermont Housing and Conservation Board 